first. To many people, Graceland is a must-visit shrine dedicated to one of the most popular performers of the 20th century, Elvis Presley. But amidst the hype and hysteria, it is easy to forget that Graceland was once a family home. Elvis bought the 13.8 acre estate in Memphis, Tennessee for just over $100,000 in 1957. He moved into the house that was to become the lifelong home for himself and parents Gladys and Vernon and grandmother Minnie Mae in 1957. Part of the move from nearby Auburn Drive was motivated by the fact that enthusiastic fans were already intruding on his and his neighbours' lives. Elvis was a smash hit with teenage fans right from the start. After purchasing the property, Presley carried out extensive modifications to suit his needs and tastes. It's now a treasure trove of kitsch, a field stone wall surrounding the grounds, a wrought iron music style gate, a swimming pool, a racquetball court, and the famous jungle room which features an indoor waterfall, among other modifications. Besides being the first icon of rock, Elvis was a legend for his generosity to his friends and sometimes to people he didn't know. In death, his fans have returned the same loyalty he showed to those close to him. Graceland is now statistically the second most visited private residence in the United States, just behind the White House. Graceland was open to the public in 1982 and was first listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 1991 was finally declared a National Historic Landmark in 2006. For fans, the Elvis Museum is an essential visit. It changes its exhibits annually to show off thousands of artefacts that are not part of regular displays at the mansion. Memorabilia plays a vital role in keeping the Elvis legend alive. After all, it's in many cases also a link to the youth of many of his fans. One exhibition depicts the professional and personal highlights of Elvis's 1956 tour, with photography, footage, archival documents, wardrobe and personal items, including a television he actually shot. Elvis was known to have a fascination with guns, but fortunately his only victim was the television. Also on display was the Gibson guitar Elvis used during many early performances and recording sessions. Well, some of the things that we have on exhibit here pertaining to Elvis's life after dark would be some items from upstairs from his bedroom, including a fiber optic light that used to sit on top of his TV. We have it actually sitting on top of one of the television sets that Elvis actually shot out from his Palm Springs home. We also have uh, an outfit Elvis was pictured wearing when he stopped at an accident site on I-240 to help out the Memphis cops one night. Then we have some of his jumpsuits, a couple gold records, a little bit of everything. It kind of touches on, the exhibit touches on the fact that, you know, if this is the only part of Graceland that you see, you're going to be able to see a gold record, a jumpsuit, as well as some furnishings in the house. On August 16, 1977, Elvis died in his bathroom at Graceland allegedly from a heart attack, according to one medical examiner report at the time. However, there are conflicting reports as to the cause of his death. After initially being buried at Forest Hill Cemetery, Presley's remains were moved to Graceland, where he was interred with his parents, Gladys and Vernon Presley, and his grandmother, in what are called the Meditation Gardens. For a boy who grew up in the glare of the public spotlight, his home has become a poignant reminder of the price he paid. The estate has become a pilgrimage for Elvis fans across the world. Coming up, celebrating Indigenous arts in Paris. Not all landmarks are easy to support. Take the case of a new Parisian museum which celebrates indigenous art from four continents. Even the choice of a name for what is now called the Musée de Quai was not an easy one. Criticism forced the founders to opt for the name of the street the museum was built on because of oversensitivity regarding France's colonial past. Une sorte de, de cité des arts. This is a kind of city of non-European arts and cultures. 
à permettre It's a place for Europeans and tourists from Paris and France who are going to visit this museum to encode the non-European world le monde non the world which wasn't born within the Mediterranean area The Musée de Quai Branly was built next to the Eiffel Tower in central Paris and was opened in 2006 at a cost of around 230 million euros. It was promoted by France's President Jacques Chirac after he was first elected in 1995. At first, organizers thought that the museum's name should be linked to the concept of primitive arts, as it would be hosting works of art and traditional objects from indigenous society in Africa, Asia, the Americas and Oceania. Some critics said the decision of dedicating a new museum to indigenous arts from outside Europe might only contribute to their isolation. Organizers replied by claiming that the museum's purpose was that of making people aware of foreign cultures other than their Western one. Behind a flower bed covering its main wall, the museum also features a cinema and a library, in addition to the exhibition venues, where about three and a half thousand of the over 300,000 objects bought by the Musée de Quai Branly are displayed. The artworks range from African wood statues to South American and Middle Eastern textiles and include a number of Polynesian masks and sculptures. Inside the museum itself, we present about three and a half thousand items in an amazing place because Jean Nouvel has conceived a huge one-piece gallery. There are not many walls inside the Musée de Quai Branly. There are even less doors. So this is a 200-meter-long piece. It's Paris's longest gallery, inside which one can walk as in a landscape, comparing in a very free way some works from Asia and Oceania, because we can pass from one world's region to the other. The museum was designed by French architect Jean Nouvel. The main building is an elongated futuristic structure that guides visitors up a white circular ramp before plunging them into dark galleries displaying the works. The museum opened at a time when France was struggling to understand how its colonial past has affected its present. In May, France had its first annual commemoration day for victims of the slave trade. In the same year, there were a series of riots involving impoverished teenagers, many whose families came from France's former African colonies. The country responded with a two-pronged approach, tough new immigration laws countered by efforts to make minorities feel recognized. The context of the opening temporarily overshadowed what will become one of the lasting legacies of former president Jacques Chirac. He was the driving force behind the museum concept. It is the latest in a lengthening line of presidential-inspired arts projects. The late French president, Francois Mitterrand, inaugurated the Louvre's Glass Pyramid, the modern Bastille Opera, other massive projects in the 1980s. Paris's most recent major museum, the Georges Pompidou Centre for Modern Art, named after another president, opened in 1977. His primitive arts museum had to overcome years of setbacks and controversies. It appears the Musée de Quai Branly is following a similar path. Few landmarks remain completely unchanged during their lifetime, especially if they have a long lifespan in a large and bustling city. That is the case with one of Shanghai's most distinctive icons, the Waibudu or the White Crossing Bridge. The name originally meant the Bridge of the Outermost Ferry, but for the past few decades, it has been in the heart of China's second largest city. And now, as part of a major redevelopment of the city's waterfront area, the bridge is being taken apart, bolt by bolt, and moved to a shipyard. The bridge has been portrayed in many Chinese novels and in movies. To some, conjures up romantic images. Moviegoers from around the world may recognize it from the Steven Spielberg film, The Empire of the Sun. The Chinese have long memories, and to some, the bridge is a symbol of oppression by the West after Shanghai was carved up following the Opium War in 1842. Westerners were allowed to cross the bridge for free, but locals who built it had to pay a toll. 
When I was a child, we learned that before China was liberated, the entrance to this area, Huangpu Park, had a sign on the door saying, no dogs, no Chinese. I didn't understand the meaning of all that when I was a child. But as an adult, I realized that it's humiliating for our country. And that's created the history of the Waibadu Bridge. Anyway, that's what I think now. But since China's economy is moving ahead, the value of the bridge has been reappraised. After the People's Republic of China was formed in 1949, many of the buildings were left without maintenance for decades. Now there's a new trend to renovate old buildings and bring glory to some of China's most historic structures. The Waibadu Bridge move is part of a much larger project to build a broad pedestrian zone on the city's waterfront. It is hoped the project will be finished ahead of Shanghai's World Expo in 2010. Zhen Shiling, the director of the committee responsible for preserving old buildings, says the bridge reminds many locals of the hardship past generations had to endure. This is from 1907, and that was the time of the foreign settlement, so it gives the impression that the foreigners built it. And sometimes, personal history and the concession period when the bridge was built can overlap. And adding to that, in the past, the Huangpu Park made the Chinese feel humiliated, as Chinese and dogs weren't allowed to enter. People remembering this can get such feeling. But for the young, this bridge is a scenic spot. From here, you can not only see the Suzhou Creek, but also Pudong. You can see the north of the Suzhou Creek, the south of Suzhou Creek. It's a very beautiful spot, and it's the city's link. One thing is for sure, the views of the waterfront are special. Shanghai has long been considered China's most cosmopolitan city. Its waterfront heritage exposed locals to many cultures and influences, while other Chinese cities remained sheltered. And with a population nearing 20 million, its so-called dialect can be considered a language on its own. In the modern era, it's a bustling commercial center attracting business from around the world. To one local resident, the bridge is part of her heritage, and she hopes it will be back in working order in the near future. I hope it will be returned to its original place quickly, because we in Shanghai are especially attached to it. The bridge will rest at a shipyard for a year, where it will get its first major polish in decades. In the meantime, the ever-increasing traffic, like the river it passes over, will keep flowing. Coming up, Hollywood gets a fresh coat of paint. Hollywood has long considered itself the centre of the movie universe, and here's the shot to prove it. The Hollywood sign as captured from space. Back down on Earth, the Hollywood sign recently underwent a facelift. It's been sitting high above the city of Los Angeles since 1923 and is, not for the first time, receiving a scrub down and a fresh coat of white paint. The job was not as easy as it sounds. The south-facing sign is deceptively large. The letters are each 24 feet wide and 45 feet high, or 8 by 15 meters. Despite their size, they are in fact a few feet shorter than the original version. I'd noticed that the mother nature had been very tough on the front of the sign. So when Baycal and Red Diamond Coating called and said, we'll offer a gift to the citizenry of Hollywood to repaint the sign, it was perfect timing and a heck of a Christmas gift for all of Los Angeles. It's not the first time this sign has got its timing right. The Hollywood land sign was originally advertising a land development and was not intended as a permanent display but as is often the case in life and the movies, timing is everything. The infant Hollywood was growing rapidly and was at the height of its fantastic dream factory period in the early 1920s. Silent movie epics such as The Thief of Baghdad 
and the Ten Commandments swept Hollywood to the forefront of world cinema. Hollywood sign history goes back to 1923. At that time, it was 13 letters, not nine, and it said Hollywoodland. It was an advertisement for selling homes up on this hillside. It wasn't until 1949 that the sign actually said Hollywood to promote the entertainment industry. But perhaps the myth of the Hollywood sign was not complete until an element of pathos was imposed upon it. That happened one lonely day in September 1932, when one of those disappointed actors, Peg Entwistle, committed suicide by jumping to her death from the letter H. For some, the dream factory became a nightmare. For Peg, the sign had become a symbol of the industry that had rejected her. The sign was originally erected in the spirit of the great American advertising tradition, which was, if you've got something to say, say it loud and long. In the pre-1950 version, the sign was studded with nearly 4,000 light bulbs to give you the idea at night, just in case you didn't get the message during the day. The sign's power isn't just the result of the power of its name, there is an element of optical illusion as well. From the ground, the contours of the hills give the sign its well-known wavy appearance. When observed at a comparable altitude, the letters appear straight across. Of course, there is an element of movie kitsch about the sign. Hollywood is, after all, just a suburb of a very large city, Los Angeles. Parodies and manipulation of the sign have been done for decades. Cities around the world have copied the winning formula, that is, to put up a large sign and put it in a prominent location. And the original sign itself was open to rearrangement, although it is now illegal to do so. There are other ways of the rearranging the letters that are not recommended. The letter H itself was destroyed when the sign's 1940s caretaker drove home drunk, lost control and actually smashed his car into the letter. A sign for these times is the presence of security cameras, unlike in previous eras where people, if they made the effort to climb or drive up the hill, had free access to the sign it is now closed to the public. So to keep the sign safe, we have many security cameras on the sign, in back of the sign, and below the sign. So the police are watching the sign and the trails coming up to it 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Whichever way the Hollywood sign is viewed, from up close, or from outer space, it remains one of the most recognizable signs in the world. What you are viewing is the reconstruction of a dream, the Amber Room, in Catherine's Palace in St. Petersburg, Russia. The original room may be lost forever, but through the joint efforts of two former vicious adversaries, Russia and Germany, the room has been recreated. The leaders of the two traditional European superpowers, Vladimir Putin of Russia and then Premier Gerhard Schroeder of Germany, came together as part of St. Petersburg's 300th anniversary. Such was the intensity of their conflict in World War II the act was considered part of the continuing healing process between the two countries. Some landmarks have a history so rich, colourful and painful that its story sometimes overshadows the landmark itself. Since the early 18th century, the original Amber Room represented a joint effort of German and Russian craftsmen. Both countries maintained an interest. In the 18th century, Frederick the Great sent Queen Catherine more Baltic Amber to fill out the originals in a new design. This is the only surviving pre-war color photograph of the original Amber Room. The room's panels looked like a mosaic. It was made up of shaped, flat pieces of different shaded golden amber, inlaid with carved figures. There were many other amber ornaments, like carved tulips and roses. Amber is a clear yellow sap which becomes fossilized over millions of years. It sometimes traps insects on flora, producing a perfect permanent cast. The Amber Room is just one of 78 St. Petersburg's landmarks put under reconstruction since 2000. 
under the 300th anniversary restoration program. The original construction of the room from amber panels was commissioned by Frederick I of Prussia as he passed through an amber-rich corner of his kingdom, Kaliningrad, then called Konigsberg. When Peter the Great passed through Berlin in 1716, he expressed admiration for the room. Frederick I's son, Frederick William, made him a present of it. In the 1750s, the room was installed 30 years later in the Catherine Palace, where it was extended by placing mirrors between the amber panels, transforming an intimate parlour into a grand chamber of 100 square meters. To me, this room means the greatest part of my life. I put into this work a major part of my life, emotions and feelings of the young person who came here within his skills and capabilities. I grew up here and I have become an artist craftsman. When Germany invaded Russia in October 1941, Soviet authorities decided that the room's amber panels were too fragile to be removed or evacuated. They were, however, removed by German troops and carried off to Konigsberg, now Kaliningrad. With Germany besieged in the last days of the war, the room was packed up and stored in 27 crates and shipped out. That was the last time anyone saw it. In 1997, one of the panels was found in a private collection in Germany. The Berlin government bought the panel and presented it to Russia two years later. After years of unsuccessful searches, the Soviet leadership has decided to restore the room. But those charged with restoration face an uneasy task. All that remained from the original room was a series of black and white photographs and one color slide. But hope was rekindled in early 2008, when treasure hunters claimed to have found two tons of looted Nazi gold. The son of a former Luftwaffe radio operator said his father's wartime diary suggested the room might be buried near the German village of Deutschendorf. The digging process was slow because of the fear of booby traps, but even if the location is correct, experts are not holding out much hope of a recovery. Amber doesn't keep well when stored.